Uh, good afternoon. Um, we're here to, um, at the request of CTA, to impact bargain the positions that were created with the ESSER funds. Um, I, you know, I, to be quite honest, I'm not quite sure what we're bargaining the impact of. Um, there's been no material, substantial, or significant changes to anything that would warrant um, impact bargaining. The positions, um, and Ms. Marsh is going to is sending them over to you as a PDF. We have them all on a PDF document, a spreadsheet with um, the job codes attached. They are all positions within the bargaining unit already. Um, just like we might add a reading coach at a particular school on any one year or add a, a um, math coach or a science teacher or a phys ed teacher at any school, we do this every single year. We add additional positions. <laughs> In this case, we have um, monies that were given to us by the federal government in order to provide um, more support to some of our, our highest, you know, neediest children because of the um, the learning loss associated with the, the pandemic. Um, that's all we've done is just added positions at certain schools. So would you like to explain why you think impact bargaining is even required? Well, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, you have 369 positions that you're adding to the uh, to the unit. Now, I don't know if all of those are ours or not. We can get into that, you know, as we talk about the various positions. But there has to uh, be a position on negotiated. We believe on how these positions will be. Uh, obtained and how they will be ended when the funds run out because now we have difficulty with people applying at this late date and being released to go to the job once they once they get it and we don't have any kind of agreement that says how that will happen and normally when we have positions like this we will, it will be clear to everybody how people will be able to obtain uh, those jobs. And right now, the way the way I see it, at least, you have 369 positions that will be ending at all at one time. And where do these people go in terms of their regular job? You know, and on one email I saw, Vicki, where you responded that they would be non reappointed, considered as non reappointed. And then I think there was another email that may have communicated that they may have been you at it. In either case, you know, I would be concerned about where these people will be employed because there will be people in those jobs in the 369 positions already. So that means that they either have to bump somebody or I know we will have some turnover, but not 369 worth, you know, of specific positions and specific areas of certification. You know, so that's one area that we're concerned about, too, would be their specialist positions. Now, are, are those specialists that are administrative or are those specialists as part of our bargaining unit? Uh, there, aren't, yeah. there aren't specialists that are part of your bargaining unit. There are specialists in teaching and learning that provide support to teachers working at particular programs. We've had that for years. It's not within your I'm bargaining unit. Yeah, I'm not questioning that. I just, I'm just saying it says specialists. I didn't know. Correct. Yeah, just these are just... It is they're, a, they're specialists, they're in teaching and learning, and they're providing support to those teachers at those particular schools. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I push back a little bit on that we don't know how these people are going to get these positions, just like any other position that becomes available outside the, the voluntary transfer period. Under the contract, both the principals at both schools um, can, uh, you know, agree when and they get the regionals to agree that people can transfer outside of voluntary transfer period. So that's nothing new. Um, at the end of the grant, which is three years, or not grant, but the funding, which is three years, you know, our intent is they would be back absorbed back into our system because in our mind, these are veteran teachers that have a lot of experience that they would be moving. These are teaching positions. So if they have a PSC, they still have a job with the district. You know, the only time they might be non-reappointed is if they are an AC teacher and there's um, there is grounds to do so. You know, we do have turnover. We have a teacher shortage. We have vacancies every year. So if the teachers want to move into these positions, um, you know, at the end of three years, then we would look at where are we going to place them at the end of the three years. They would be um, just like a UAT 
and it's more the specialists that could be non-reappointed than the than the um, bargaining unit positions. But you know, we're, we don't have any intention of just, you know, hiring teachers into 300 and something positions and then dumping them all. That's not our intent because we we need highly qualified teachers in those positions. Um, you know, every year we have vacancies. So our intent is they would just be absorbed back into whatever positions we have available. If they wanted to, you know, if they wanted to stay at that school because it would be a UAD at that particular school. Um, let's say the, the school has an extra reading coach, a math coach, and they need to, um, they're losing those units per the funding. It would just be like any other UAD. If those are the most senior teachers, then yeah, they would bump the more, the more, um, the newer teachers with less seniority, just like it, it's in the contract. So this is not anything different or outside of the contract. Well, again, my concern is normally on a situation like this, we would have an MOU about how these people would be hired, what the transferring process would be, you know, some kind of an agreement. Because right now, what we have is people obtaining jobs, they go on the interview, uh, interviewing for jobs, the principal hires them, the regional superintendent approves it, they go to another area, that regional superintendent decides not to approve it, you know. So now you got a person, you know, where you got people getting jobs and then not, not getting jobs. And that doesn't seem to be something that we want to have our teachers experience. You know, that's a negative situation and we feel that that should not should not be well i would i we don't enter into mous when we're doing we're just hiring extra teachers at schools if we if it suddenly we think there's going to be a um an influx let's say there's a new uh, community being built near i don't know i'm going to say park vista because it seems like everything's being built by park vista you know, they're building a new community by there. We're going to anticipate they're going to be X number of students in there. We're going to increase the number of teachers there. We don't enter into an MOU. Um, and even if it's if it's short term, because I know that we've had situations back when there's been um, uh, disasters in other parts of the country where we absorb students like under after Katrina, after the earthquake in Haiti, we absorbed additional students. We knew that we were going to get X number of students either from the you know, from the New Orleans area, or we're getting students coming in from Haiti, and we just increased the staffing at those schools, knowing that those children are most likely within a year or two going to go back, um, but we would just treat it as a UAT. Um, I don't see that there's any reason why we would have an MOU just because we're increasing the number of teachers. If we were hiring, let's say we just decided we were going to say we're our class um, – you know, we're going to decrease the size of our classrooms. We're going to have fewer kids in every classroom and increase the number of teachers. We wouldn't have an MOU for that. So, well, Keith, you had a question? Yeah, I just want – and then through the UAP process, it's going to follow seniority according to the contract as well at the school site. So if, if a school cannot absorb um, a position at the end of the three years – we're going to file the contract accordingly. So if the school has more positions than they need, and it's not necessarily these individuals be you at it, whoever has least seniority. Well, well, yeah, and I and I clearly understand what the contract says in terms of what would happen with those 369 people should you know when those jobs end. We know that these jobs are going to end now, and so what I'm saying is we should have a process in place for dealing with that. We also need to have a process in place for people obtaining these jobs. Because but yeah, we already do. It's in the contract. The contract is very clear how it works. So well, I don't understand why we have to do something different when really? these are not any different than I see your hand, Denise. Hold on. Than than any other year where we're hiring extra teachers. Or we have grant funded positions. We don't have MOUs for every grant that we have where we have grant funded teachers. But remember now, Vic, we're talking about three hundred and sixty nine positions. It's not see you're talking about what happens normally within the school district, but this is not normal. This is something special. This is limited funding for a limited time of time period. And so what we're saying is there should be something structured around this. Why would you want to have your teachers go through a hiring process where they go and interview for a job, they get it, and then they can't get it? You know, that doesn't seem to make sense. That's something you want to have your teachers experience. What, is, what does limited. that mean that they apply for it and then they get it and they don't get it? What does that mean? That means that I, I got a job in at Park Vista, and I'm going to another area. My regional and the my regional and my principal approves the transfer. The 
uh, the principal at the other school approves the transfer because they hired the person. And now the regional says, no, you can't go. Those are the kind of situations. The regional I'm superintendent that says that they're not approving any transfers. So right. people are applying. And the situation is much different than normal. Because if these positions had come available prior to the close of voluntary transfer, we wouldn't have been having this conversation, obviously. But people want the opportunity to be able to go into these positions. And so that's one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about it, so that everybody's on the same page. So that because there are 300 and some odd positions, that people are going to be applying, that everybody has the same rules. Okay, and it's just specifically for these positions. We're not looking to go outside and have a history teacher move over to an English position. We're talking specifically, and that's why we're looking to have guidelines in place for these specific positions at the different levels. And I, I understand it, but we feel that the contract provides enough protection to the employees, provides us with the structure that we need to create an MOU just for these positions. But we're already I mean, running. and I and I get that a lot of the regionals don't want them moving around because it's going to create some vacancies at schools where vacancies can't be afforded. But that's that's the standard of what happens every year. We have people who apply, you know, at this time of year because an opening comes up at a school they want to go to. Let's say they want to be the ESE contact at a different school than the one they're at now. They, they don't automatically just get to do it because it's it's what they want at that time. We have provisions in the contract that allow for all of this to work. We don't believe that we need to go outside the contract for any of this. Well, here's the thing. Again, I, I don't know if you were uh, hearing me or, or, or not, but I'm saying that these are outside of what we normally uh, deal with in terms of the number of positions. And what I hate to have happen is for it to be an ugly situation, particularly at the end. I mean, it's ugly right now already because you got people getting jobs and getting them approved and then not being able to make the transfer. Uh, that That's a negative situation that any employer probably want to avoid from an employee having to experience, especially after having had, you know, last year happen to us. But the, the even more concerning problem is when the job ends, you know, in, in three years, then, uh, how will these transfers take place? You can have mass upheaval in schools where you got, you know, uh, say four or five positions of people trying to transfer, you know, and they end up being a UAT and then they go in and pull somebody out of that school who's been there for, you know, three years or five years and they've been 15 years. Now they got to move these people. That's going to cause uh, uh, disharmony among staffs. And so what we're trying to do is find a process in place that everybody would understand and everybody would know that this is what would happen. Other than because if I'm at a school in my position and I see somebody coming in in math and I know that they got more time in math than I do, that means that this person will probably bump me when the time comes for the, the thing to end. You know, when the, when this position when these when this position ends. And so what we're trying to do is find a way in which we can set up a process so that everybody understands what's going to happen from the beginning. Yeah, and, and I hear everything you're saying, Theo. I just think we have the capacity to handle it, even with that great a number of, of employees. Given our, our level of vacancies, given the fact that there's a teacher shortage, given the fact that, you know, we lose teachers every year, we're going to lose more teachers coming in because there's teachers who don't want to come back to the classroom. We know that there's going to be attrition, and, and your um, industry, if it, as it were, is is – is floundering. People are not going into education. They're not graduating from schools of education. We feel that we can absorb that level of employees back into our system without the upheaval you think it's going to cause. Now, anybody who takes the job has to know that the job is a three-year job. And at that point, they may have to move or they could bump somebody. I mean, but that happens every single year when a school hires an employee that's got more seniority than somebody who may have been there since they open, but the person they're bringing in has has been to the district longer. I, we just don't feel that having any other process in place is necessary given the fact that we already have a process. Justin? Thank you. So I, I, I have a question about the, the kind of job title crosswalk um, how many people 
prior to to these federal funds and the creation of these PLC facilitators, how many people were employed as learning team facilitators in the past year or two? Well, I don't, I don't have that kind of numbers off the top of my head of who did what, um, you know, and how many of those that we've hired. I don't have so that information. I guess the, the root of my question would be, I understand that the district has asserted that these new positions align with existing job titles that that have already been in the contract um i don't know if we necessarily agree with that but that that would be where that's just one example of, of a question where if for instance learning team facilitator which i haven't heard used in some time um maybe my whole career for what it's worth but if there's an old job code based on conditions from five or 10 years ago, and it hasn't been used in a long time. I don't know if, if we subscribe to the idea that the new position is the same and, and thus our request to impact bargain, because we don't necessarily agree that these new positions are aligned. So that I figured that would be one way to determine, if, for instance, again, just using that example, if, if there were no people employed as learning team facilitators last year or two years or the past five years, um, I think that lends to the point that trying to crosswalk of what was essentially a dead position uh, to be a position for a hundred something, 200 people, we might have an issue with that. Well, they're not dead positions. They're positions that have actual people in them already. Um, budget is the one who took the district job codes and aligned them to the funding. So you should have an email that has the crosswalk here where the teacher, the job, the job titles, what the support they're providing, because when you'll see in there, like, you know, professional learning community, PLC facilitator, it's really the same teaching and learning team facilitator. It's just got a different name to, for it under the SASP resources. So like teacher elementary resource, they're calling them an acceleration teacher because they're targeting third grade and gifted program. They're the same positions. They're just kind of giving them a, a different, um, support function title, if you were, to align with this project. But the positions already exist, a teacher elementary reader. We already have those. We have lots of teachers in those positions. The support position is called a reading recovery teacher is what it is. It's doing the same function as a teacher elementary reading is doing. So they went and aligned all of these. There's a support a description positions. It's got everything already lined up for you. We handed it over to you um, a few minutes ago. The specialist positions are not in your bargaining unit. They're in teaching and learning just like they've always been. Keith? And read, like for read recovery, we could give you a list of schools. And we've had that, I think, maybe two years. Um, or I know at least last year. So there's a number of people doing read recovery position. Obviously, intensive reading, math, we have many of those throughout the districts, uh, those type of positions. You know, uh, SAI teachers, we have many of those. So many of the positions that are on there, we already have in the district. Uh, PLC facilitator, we have people who facilitate PLCs all the time. Um, so I'm not sure. And all the job codes, remember when we we changed the collective bargaining agreement to have your recognition section look similar to what SEIU has with the job codes and the titles? Every single one of these job codes are in your recognition section of the collective bargaining agreement. Okay, what, what about the graduation teacher? Now that says teacher secondary other. So how, you wanna I, talk about what that job entails? So similar to intensive reading or math, but the main focus is ACT, SAT prep um, for students who have met the concordance score uh, for graduation. So the schools could either do pull up for small group instruction, they could do um, push in, they could build in a smaller class size for the teacher, but it's direct instruction around um, SAT, uh, ACT prep because of the concordance change that's happening with graduation for next year. You know how the this is the first cohort that's getting hit with that that new requirement. So, so what you're saying is is that you know your job code for this one, you just took a position and created it, and titled it other rather than negotiating rather than impact bargaining a new position. No, that position already exists. Teacher secondary other already exists. 
what else does it mean except teaching something other within the secondary realm? This is something that you guys went to park and adopted. So we're just using the job codes that are already there in order to do what we need to do for these schools. Okay, so basically what you're saying is any job you create this uh, in our bargaining unit, you just put it under teacher secondary other or teacher elementary other or teaching middle, you know, uh, well, if the if the positions are there, if we've if we've already negotiated that the teacher secondary other um, is part of the your bargaining unit, then I mean, what you're saying is we can't hire anybody unless we run it by you first. We can't create any positions without running it by you first, and that's why we have the recognition section. If we want to have teacher middle math and make it an intensive math teacher. We don't have to come to you and negotiate that. That's a management right to say you're teaching middle grade math. We're going to have you teach intensive or you're going to your teacher secondary other. We want you to focus on kids who are having difficulty graduating or high school reading. Let's let's you're going to do intensive literacy. I mean, we do this all the time, the, not to this number of teachers. I mean, I would think that this is a blessing for you that we're able to hire 300 and something new teachers into your bargaining unit. Well, I think that the concern, as Theo mentioned earlier, is that no teacher that already works for the district has the opportunity to be hired, even if offered a job, unless a number of other people approve and, and hundreds of jobs were not created until after that voluntary transfer window. That, again, we could, it's a, a broader conversation about whether or not these we think these job titles literally mean that any position could be created in any scenario. But um, the idea that no existing employee could just transfer because they were advertised at the tail end of the window or have been trickling in after that, that's been a big concern that we've seen a number of teachers, as Theo said, getting a job offer, having both principals approve, and then a regional or one of two regionals would reject it. Um, I, I don't know if there's a way to, to solve that at the front end and tell these principals not to offer jobs until they know they're approved, but that seems to be a better solution than giving someone a job offer, having both principals agree, having one regional out of two agree, and then, you know, a fifth person out of five, out of five shoots them down. So that, that's a big concern. The other part on this too is that that's the reason why we want an MOU because it's a specific situation that's come up. We've got the opportunity where we've been able to hire um, hire all these additional people. So we're just concentrating on that. We're not talking the rest of the time outside of what normally happens and the prospects of that. But what I'm also looking at is I'm looking at this document that came out of Oh, Keith, your office, okay? And it has in here, because this these are the questions. It listed the, the subject or the teachers at each of these. And the concern that we have is, for example, that one under secondary was the graduation teacher, number, two, number four, the PLC facilitator, and number six, a sunset programming, which I have no understanding of how that teacher position works and it's not even listed on the form that was just sent to us here that's not a that's just extra uh, period supplements okay but that's what i'm saying keith we don't know that okay so if you're saying that's an extra that's a six period supplement well then we needed to know that in order for teachers to understand that and for us to understand it so if somebody picks that up that's what what it entails right and that's what these conversations are about but every time we do something at the district level that's within the terms of the contract it doesn't necessarily require that we have an mou or do anything special i mean we can talk about um possibly you know having conversations with the, the regionals as to why i mean how many how many people are we talking about that you have heard from that have had this happen that they were offered the job in the regional and went in and said no how many are we talking about Theory. Yeah, if only one teacher, you know, have this. No, problem, no, 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 no. I want to hear hard numbers, not if only one teacher. I get that, you know. But I hear what you're saying. But I'm telling you that this is a problem for us. If one teacher goes through that negative experience, that is a problem. So we're saying, how do we go about resolving that? 
You well, know. what we can do is we can talk to the regionals and find out if you could tell us which regional it is that denied this one person, um, you know, we can have the regional and find out. I'm sure there's a reason for it because they want to they want to hire for these positions as much as we do um, at the district but, level. So they know the importance of it. Hold on, Denise. So they want to make sure that these positions are staffed, but they also need to make sure that the schools are fully staffed. So if there is a, a regional that we need to talk to or somebody that's blocking, as you said, all of these, then let us know who that is so we can have the conversations. But it does, it seems like the process should work just like every other case. It's just on a broader scale. So Denise. So the thing is, is that if a principal who hires and the principal who releases, they obviously are working at their schools and know what their positions are and know what the openings are and knows that if I'm releasing um, Theo to go work at Randall's school, then I know I'm going to have an opening, then they know that. And so if they've made the determination that they're going to fill that position and their regional superintendent is okay with it, then why would it be denied by the incoming regional person? That's that's where and that's and that's the question I'm asking. I mean, who, which regional is you? I I can't get a grasp on. Is it every regional or is it one regional? I mean, what, I'm not getting any information from you except for if it happens to one here's, teacher. Here's, so I get it. All right, but, well, here's the problem, Vicky. You know, uh, every teacher who has that situation happen to them may not contact us and say that that is a problem. So what we do know as a part of process, it can be a problem and it has happened. And so what we're trying to do is avoid these negative situations, you know? And so- I, I understand, and we'll, but- We'll call you and tell you the principal, I don't, you mean the, the regional, I don't want to necessarily identify a regional here, but, uh, but we can call you and tell you who the regional is and where the position, where, where it is after this meeting ends. So okay. we don't have a problem sharing that with you. Uh, but uh, we're just concerned about this process. And even, and as I said, you know, in three years, I think we're gonna have some major problems because normally, you know, when we do US and all that, it's not, you know, that big a deal. And we had huge numbers. It does become a major problem trying to find people specific positions, because that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for just, some, just a job. We're talking about specific job titles for these people and there would be disruption and it seemed like you would have an interest in trying to make sure that that's handled in a smooth way we do uh, and we we feel that if in three years or two and a half years when we start looking at the fundings end and what are our vacancies if we need to do something outside the collective bargaining agreement we'd certainly come to you and say hey we need to do it but right now we don't need to do that we don't feel that there's going to be a problem and in three years you know who knows who's the governor is going to be we may have the revenue to to keep those positions we may have the ability from the federal government in three years they may be funding schools at a higher rate i mean there seems to be a trend in that direction at least on the federal level of providing more and more to public education so if if that's the case then maybe we don't have to you know eliminate these positions maybe these become permanent as as well they probably should keith and with attrition, it's usually approximately about a thousand teachers a year that we turn over. So that's why we're more than comfortable that these teachers will have positions just because of the turnover that we see from year to year. Denise. Yeah, for from a quick study on uh, this uh, PLC thing. Uh, versus LTM, there were approximately only three people employed in it last year. So um, we're looking at this PLC position as being a new position. It is not the same as when we used to have learning team meetings, which was years ago, because I used to be in the calendar because it was at the secondary level for the most part. Um, and now you're putting them into all levels. So there's the concern and the issuance of that and how these people are actually going to be used. I know you have some little, um, you have a blurb here, but that's not our concern is how. So there you go. This is, these people are here just to provide additional support for the teachers who volunteer to do PLCs. Again, it's still going to be teacher led. It's still going to be voluntary. We're not changing anything. We feel that they're learning team facilitators, the same position. It's, we don't feel that there's any different to it, difference to it. Um, 
you know, and I think at this point, it's difficult for, you know, someone to argue otherwise. Um, because you haven't seen these in practice yet. Keith, do you have anything to add about the the, um, the PLC's positions? Because we know that there are PLC's positions out there. Yeah, the, LT, the LTF language, we shifted from LTF to PLC to be in alignment with just national conversations around, nationally they call PLC's, but we had traditionally called LTF's or LTM's. So we shifted our language so for our context, at least, in, you know, Dr. Sheffield and myself, LTF and PLC would be one and the same. So the PLC position, um, again, they're happening throughout um, the district, as you all know, because you hear about that. So I, I'm not sure how that's, Denise, it's new, because it's not new. It's something, as you stated, that we did years ago that we've continued to do. No, not as LTMs. How's it different? LTMs in the past were actually scheduled. Used to be on the secondary level, used to have half days, and then the students would come in. Uh, oh, how about the late start days? Yeah, but then that was, we've, we've shifted from LTMs to PLCs. We've just kept the same job title you know, it's learning teacher, learning team facilitator. We've shifted to PLCs, like Keith said, years ago. This is not something new that we just did. This happened several years ago. Um, so, you know, if you want us to go to the, the board and have the title changed, and then you can go to PERC and have the title changed in your group, but it's the same job code. We just don't call learning team meetings anymore. We call them PLCs. Well, I, I can tell you, you know, I guess the concern I have is basically what you've done is you set up two columns to identify the job code. Uh, uh, you got the job, the job code itself. Uh, of course, that's 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 that that exists. But then you say the district job title, and then you change, you add in another column called support. And on the support, you give a different name to the same to another to another job title. So, you know, you can pretty much do that with any position and not have to go and challenge perk. And we're not necessarily even challenging the names and the titles of position. I just don't like the manner in which it's being done because it doesn't seem to be straightforward uh, because other is is not what the, you know, our language to perk really talked about. And uh, PLC and TLT and LTF, they're, they're not uh, one and the same in terms of of the position and how it's how it's managed, but in either case, you know that's not our challenge. We just want to definitely identify the fact that that does exist and that concerns us because in the future, you know that same type of uh, action, you know, may be exercised, and, and and we just disagree with that. The other part of this is, I guess we have a general question: is why weren't we, you know, why didn't you bring this information to us beforehand? And we could have probably avoided, you know, having a a, a a discussion from a side of challenging, we could have had an understanding in the beginning, and then we could have discussed what this process was, would be in terms of, you know, hiring and and, and transferring people at the end, you know, and, I, and I'm saying that not so much that it was going to change what happened here, but in the future, you know, does a district have a desire to talk to us about positions in our bargaining unit prior to doing major changes like this? Well, Theo, this was this wasn't you, you keep talking about like we're doing this on the sly. This was board workshops. We've been talking about this for months at the board meetings. There's presentations. You know, we have a link here, the 2020 the, the budget development workshop. It was in budget development. It was when we talked about, you know, summer school. We talked we've talked about these positions for a very long time. So it's not like we've been hiding anything. Um, we just don't feel that we have to, you yeah. know. I'll let Keith go. Keith, go ahead. No, but correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe I am getting older, so maybe I'm losing my mind. But I, I believe Dr. Sheffield and I went through a lot of this in our previous meetings. You know, I know we've met. <laughs> she turned the camera. Um, we met in, in our regular every. I think every couple of weeks we were meeting. We we're talking about summer school and other things, and we also talked about these positions and what we were adding and taking to the board. No. And, uh, I mean, we, again, I'm getting older. Maybe I don't remember that, but I 
we've we, we, we've just been we've been talking about we've we've talked to you about this stuff before and but the okay. most of it was you know the board this was before the board meeting this is what we intended to do this was the plan and talking about it and you know until we start rolling out it, it's like you're not paying attention to what we're but telling you let me restate my question because my question was what did you have any interest in talking to us i, I know what you did all right you talked no, to well, them. we didn't feel that why theo if we're adding if we're yeah. adding a teacher elementary resource at 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 50 schools every school is getting a resource teacher we don't talk to you about that we just add the positions we've yeah. added these positions like the mental health people we've added positions we've added guidance counselors we added you know we add positions every single year this is not any different than any other year except for the magnitude which you know, I would look at if I'm in your group as an opportunity to grow your membership. But you know, we have not done anything outside the collective bargaining agreement. That's why we have it is so that we have an, an ability to work and do our jobs without having to run and say, "Mother, may I?" to the union when we don't need to do that. It's in the contract of how we staff schools, how we transfer outside the voluntary transfer period, and what we do if the schools lose use a, use, lose a unit. Well, this normally, is not you know, new. But when you have a cooperative arrangement with another body, what you would do if you're making a change of 369 you know, units in their bargaining unit, you would come to them and talk to them about this change. You wouldn't just do it blindly and not say anything to them about it. And That's we argue, and we're arguing that we have talked to you about it when we had our meetings about the summer schools and what we were doing with the ESSER funds. We've are we we felt like we had talked to you about it. Okay, well you didn't. I can tell you now. You you did well, not. No, no, Theo. You are saying we didn't. We're saying that we did. It's a difference of opinion. You don't get to tell us what we did or didn't say. You can say what you did or don't recall from the conversations, but we have recollection of having these conversations. Okay, and we disagree. And so, so we just disagree on that. No, there's no problem with that. Denise, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I'm going back and I'm looking at information. So here's the thing. Nobody knew how much money was coming down the pike, okay? So it wasn't until May 7th that DOE put out a notice that told y'all, hey, here's the money after they had gotten it from the federal government and all the increase and here's the money and here's what it could be and how much is allocated for each of the counties. And then what happened after that was that there was a workshop by the board on June 2nd. That's when you made your presentation. So prior to that, I mean, you know, I don't have to be at every negotiation session. That's up to the my employer, however, but I think he would have told me if there was conversation with regards to this in between that time period of May 7th and June 2nd. So I think that's the concern, and that's why, because it involves so many teachers, when we saw it on the board, um, what do you all call it, slideshow, that's when we started, and that's when I, we had the conversation among ourselves and reached out to you folks. Right, and, and you know, uh, if we, if you had said you're going to have LTFs, you're going to hire some uh, uh, or uh, PLC people, there is no way we would have you do that and not question or challenge that in some way. You know, so if we had that discussion, we would have brought those issues up, and we did not have a discussion about those issues. And again, it, this has already happened. I'm talking about what we're going to do in the future. If you have this kind of thing happen again, because if you don't recognize it now, then you, you, you may repeat it. And we're just trying to make sure that uh, we clearly have these conversations in the future if you're going to make these kind of kind of changes. Because you, you, I'm sure you're aware that, uh, that we didn't have discussion about 369 positions and, you know, coming in and, and people applying after the voluntary transfer period. And at the end of it, you know, they could be uh, non reappointed because you know in one of your emails Vicky you did say they will be non reappointed in, in yeah and that was that was for that was really for the specialist and I was getting it from grant funding um, but I can go back and look we started talking to you guys about oh, yeah, I'm not arguing oh, that. hold on because we February we had a meeting February 18th March 12th March 30th um, about student academic support programs April 22nd um, May 13th you know, and, and 
you know, we've had discussions. It's not like we haven't been meeting with you all along. So it's really kind of, you know, unfair to paint it in the light if we just sprung stuff. We've had these conversations and, and yeah, I mean, we didn't get the federal money until a certain point. So, you know, we've talked about the positions, the number, obviously we didn't because we didn't know how much, the, how far the federal money would go until we, we knew how much we were going to get. So well, obviously, yeah. you know, we didn't, and I mean, I think this is a good growth now in the future. I mean, I think we'll make it more clear to you that when the board's talking about these things, I mean, that's the opportunity, Mr. Katz is at these board meetings. Um, it provides him with an opportunity to have discussions or at least have his say um, during these meetings. So, and I know you have constant communication with the board. You have meetings with the superintendent with you know, with staff. Um, so, you know, if these issues are bubbling up, then we could know about it. But in our mind, we weren't doing anything beyond what the contract allows us to do. Um, you know, that any given year, we just, we're just lucky enough to be able to hire more people this year. So I see Justin and Denise with their hands raised. Thank you. So, yeah, just to clarify, we did have a number of meetings, obviously that can't be denied, but that focused almost exclusively on summer school, which wasn't relevant to these positions. Um, June 2nd was the budget workshop where it was the first time that they were spelled out. Um, and, and what I mean spelled out, not just the numbers of hires based on the funding, but uh, the varying scopes of, of jobs that would be created. Uh, so, so from that June 2nd meeting, I sent an email to my staff um, and within two weeks, we had sent the request to impact bargain. So we're not, we don't, we're not even saying that you might've had more time to come to us. It was a tight time frame because of the way the budget was presented, or at least this component of it. Um, but again, because hundreds of jobs were created, hundreds of new jobs, um, whether, you know, the district asserts that the titles still existed, they are new jobs in a, a, a variety of fashions that simply did not exist prior to this. Again, the, the, one of the big issues for us was advertising to existing employees, your most trained employees, the opportunity to apply for them and not be beholden um, you know, to whether or not a school is going to hold them hostage because they don't want to have a vacancy or an additional vacancy. Um, so again, that, you know, Theo's gone over it. I won't belabor it, but, uh, we, we just would appreciate in the future, as he said, that's a large point of this is I guess now we understand that the district's position might be that the job titles that exist encompass any hypothetical position that could ever be created. We don't That's, that's not what we're saying. Well, I mean, those other categories seem based on on what was said to. I mean, I, I can't imagine a job now that could be created that would have to be negotiated because other would be a catch all uh, for any hypothetical future job. We, we just want to make sure that especially we're not arguing if it's one job or one per school and there's, you know, 50 or 70, depending on elementary or middle or whatever. But again, in this case, it's hundreds of jobs employees are being, um, you know, gate checked basically because they weren't able to apply during the time when they're normally allowed to apply and freely move about. And then the, the confusion about the non reappointing people at the end of it, akin to a grant. Um, you know, again, we just had a number of questions that had there been a little more open dialogue about, and maybe it should have, we should have all tried to raise it during those summer school meetings because they were mostly about summer school. Um, we would have answers for our members or we would have been able to provide input at an earlier date would have allowed for these solutions that we think uh you know would be beneficial to have been discussed and maybe implemented earlier where the time crunch wasn't as pressing from your end keith you got it on mute sorry uh Duly noted, um, Justin, absolutely. And Theo, to your comment earlier, when we had you, I think we're around when we had the AAA plan. So I was a AAA principal at the time. In all the documents we saw, there was no agreements back then. Um, during AAA, when we received additional positions uh, at the school level, we used we treated that the same way when I received the additional above allocation units. So we're following that similar plan as well. 
Right. And I don't want to, you know, you know, carry this carry this out. I just wanted to make sure that you understood that we want to just talk about these beforehand if you're gonna make these changes to our unit. And you know, and you said we did meet on on, you know, have several meetings about ASAP or whatever that was. And 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 that's true, but you can't characterize those as talking about for the fall because we were talking about, as Justin said, for the summer. That's what those meetings were primarily about. They weren't about the fall. So we, we couldn't have discussed these these positions because we, we didn't we didn't know about them. But, but in either case, we're just asking in the future that we be able to do that. And I'm just saying I made that statement just for clarification of the record. Because no, understood. That's understood. OK. You know, and, and obviously, you know, this is kind of a fast moving train. Um, you know, we knew what we wanted to do. We talked about you what we wanted to do, but, um, you know, not until we get the federal funding and the budget's already lined up and everything. Do we realize how much we how much we're able to do with that money? Right. Linda? I'm just saying that we need to you know, work together on this. Right. And I, I understand. To... Understood. Okay. Glenda? Right. Need... Oh, I'm sorry. Um, thank, you. thank you. Now, I was just saying, I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm, of course, I'm working on some pieces now, but, and I mean, everything is duly noted, but I think that it's also important that, yes, these positions were not released during the course of voluntary transfer periods, not to, you know, the fault of anyone in terms of how things were coming in from DOE and, and so forth or what have you. Um, but as we initially started back, we always said that the this SAS plan was going to be out in phases. Well, we started back with these ESSER dollars back from in the fall, back from January tutorial dollars, back into the summer where we did all the summer work over, you know, the summer and a lot of our conversation around that. And then the second part now, phase two, once we realize how much dollars it is that we were dealing with. Um, and that's just where we are. I mean, do we like being in this position? Absolutely not. But I think we've been loud and clear to, you know, our principals, principal supervisors, and just working with everyone and understanding that at the end of the day, we realized that all these positions were not going to be filled at the start of the school year. And that was not the intention. Um, and we always quite, and we, I said, if we, if all these positions were filled at the start of the school year, then we need to question, have we secured them with the right individual in regards to an intended purpose and the outcome in which we were trying to achieve, not just for the students, but also for our teachers as well. Um, and then for these, the, for the teachers that may be offered positions, and a lot of them are being offered within their building, that they understand that we're offering you the position, but we will not move you into that position until your current position has been filled. Because at the end of the day, what we realize, and there is a teacher shortage, is that we have a responsibility and that responsibility is to make certain that we have as many teachers in front in working with our students as we possibly could when our students return, you know, for the very first day of school. So, you know, um, this is unterritory for all of us in regards to, you know, what, what we're dealing with right now. I mean, point taken loud and clear. I mean, we still have S of three dollars. I'm sure a lot more will be coming in. Um, and, you know, we just have to continue to navigate and continue the, the relationships and have these conversations in regards to how do we move forward and and deal with the issues at hand. Right. And, you know, and one of the things we wanted to do, we would like to to be able to do is to share with our members. Uh, how to go about approaching these positions and make sure they understand the the situation as as it relates to the contract on what would happen to them at the end of this experience you know once they get it and what they could expect when they apply for a job what that process would go would, would look like you know so that's what we're saying we would have been like to have been able to, to do that with them so that they would know because i would hate for somebody uh who end up you know getting a job in, in some place in their own school and then when they get ready to go back you know they can't get back in and they got to go and move someplace else uh outside of where they're living and not understand that that could have been an outcome at the time they, they took the job that's all that's all we're really saying denise i, I, I kind of stepped on you i'm sorry yeah i kind of get used to it after a while <laughs> um, part of the concern i uh we also have is the on these some of these positions is that there may be inconsistencies with what the requirements are for them and in other words, a principal at one school may require that somebody in order to get into a position, they have to 
have certain uh, certifications or they have to have certain languages behind them. And I understand some of that deals with depending on the population that you're working with, but there needs to be consistency and not, if we're putting jobs out there, then we put out a job that says, in order to apply for just in school, you have to have um, a reading endorsement and you have to have a, Italian as your language because those are the students you're going to be working with. Okay. So if people apply for jobs and then they're told, well, um, it's not required, but we would like to see it. But then they get told, no, but now it's required and we can't, I, I just want consistent messages. That's one of my, my concerns. Well, I'd be curious to see yeah. which schools you're talking about, which positions, because I know like I have positions posted now. When I go to post a position, I have to tell them, you know, in recruitment, what are my, what are my, um, you know, what's my screening criteria? I have to give them my screening criteria before the job even opens. So I have, I have required ones and I have preferred. So I imagine the schools are the same way unless it's something completely different. And maybe Glenda or Keith can chime in there if it's different. But, you know, I list, I have to list those prior to the job being posted. So there is, and it, the employee can go in and look at those to see what are the requirements for the job and what are posted because every school, like you said, is going to be different depending upon what they need at that particular school. Let's say for this position, I really want somebody who has not just reading endorsement, but also ESOL because the population you're working with is in intensive reading are also ESOL students. So that should be in the screening criteria before the job's ever posted. Glenda, did and, you, did, and, is that I, what you I, had I, at your schools? I agree with that. I agree with that. But that's what I'm saying is that, you know, people are saying that criteria is changing and I just want, you know, I just think it would be better to have consistency across the board. Well, they can just ask, they, it can't be consistent across the board because the needs at Dreyfus are different than the needs at uh, Palm Beach Lakes High School. So it can't have that consistency. It's based upon the needs of the school, but the school should have screening right criteria. And if the teachers are concerned that they say it keeps changing, that they can ask for those screening sheets at the end of the day, they can ask for the screening criteria. All right, Justin. Thank you. So I guess, and and to to Glenda's point, um, yeah, we we certainly don't begrudge the the time crunch because the the numbers weren't released until a certain point, and the district had to formulate their, you know, their prerogative on the creation of these positions. Um, but what what we we do want, and you know, we've alluded to it, but I guess I'll I'll phrase it as a, a formal request, you know, per our request for impact bargaining, is to allow for the next, we would like to see two weeks for existing employees with three years of completed service or more. Um, and only if they're applying to these newly created positions to be afforded, uh, you know, a voluntary transfer ESSER window so that they feel comfortable applying because that's another aspect of this. And it's, if you've worked in the schools, you, you know, it's a thing that some people they wait till voluntary transfer to apply because they know that if they get a job offer that they control their fate and, you know, there's no chance of it being rejected and then having to stay at a school where the principal now believes that they wanted to leave the school and there's stigma there that, you know, you wanted to leave the team and now you're stuck. Um, we think that more people, more of your veteran, most qualified educators would entertain these positions if, uh, you know, they were afforded a, a voluntary transfer style window where if they apply and get a job offer, there's no chance of it being rejected and then having to remain at a school where their administration thinks that they wanted to leave and wanted to go somewhere else and, and the, the concerns that exist with all that. Because, it you know, that is a real thing that a lot of a lot of teachers have where they, they wouldn't apply for a job outside of voluntary transfer for fear of looking like they wanted to leave and then getting rejected and having to stay. Um, so we that is that is something that we're asking you to entertain um, only for these new positions, not for random teaching jobs, uh, only for the next two weeks. Um, and and that would allow these veterans who presumably if you have PLC coordinators or intensive reading, you could have a, you know, a, th a four or five year teacher interested and in applying for those. But you know, a, a 10 or a 20 year teacher might be supremely more qualified 
stereotypically to lead, you know, PLCs or LTMs or whatever they are. Um, so that, that, that is a request. And then the second one, as, as Theo referenced earlier, is that, you know, there, there's already been some confusion. I think you've cleared it up to some degree about the process when there's three years or, or however long these funds might exist before they, they disappear um, to give some certainty to these teachers about what that process looks like when the time runs out um, because many of them don't know and they are assuming that they will just be slotted back in at, at their school, at their original position if they transfer internally. Um, but many of them don't understand that if they go somewhere for three years at a different school that they're, you know, they might have to choose to stay at that new school and accept a new position uh, because of the UAP process. So, you know, again, we would appreciate some specific language, even if you might view it as redundant, but just so people know that these are the terms that exist for this finite period of time in these funds. So that again, that's, those are our biggest concerns with, without going into the job title stuff, which is a, a different conversation. We just want them to be afforded a fair chance to apply without restrictions, uh, which they would have been had, had, the opportunity to been there to create these positions in April or May. Let me just make sure I have this right. So the first ask is that we extend the voluntary transfer period for two weeks. Um, the second one, and I wasn't quite clear, it seemed like you were asking for that seniority, people with more seniority be given preference for positions. Is that what that was? We just want clarification specific to these three-year positions, assuming they, they disappear in three years, as to what that, that transition process back to normalcy for those employees looks like so that they know for sure. Because right now, I think that... Right. I, I got that. That's your third one was language for terms to return back after the three years. But there was a second one. It seemed like there was some kind of seniority preference. Um, no, I, th I might have just been referring to the fact that if I take a job at a new school and under the UAP process based on seniority, you know, I would not be the person you added in most cases. Um, they, they might not realize that you're going to have to stay at that school unless you're released outside of voluntary transfer or have the foresight to voluntary transfer prior to the expiration of your job, which I mean, no one knows in three years, whether it's, there's going to be more funding, like you said, but they might not have the foresight to try to transfer out of a job they don't know is going to expire or not until after the voluntary transfer window when it's too late. That well, that's just a well, reference. That well, what work. we can do is offline, uh, I can talk to the administration about extending voluntary transfer. Um, but and then, and then the, um, the language for terms to return after the funds are gone, I'm not sure that we're comfortable doing that, mm -hmm. only because I'm not sure what that's even going to look like, except we're just referring back to the contract. Because at this point, we're talking three years from now. We don't know whether the money could be continued or not continued. We don't. So I don't feel that that's an appropriate conversation right now. I don't think it's moot for discussion or ripe for discussion at this point. I think it's kind of moot at this point. Um, obviously, we'd want to talk about it as it gets further down if we think there's going to be a problem because we don't want teachers having a lot of upheaval either. We need to keep our teachers and retain our good quality instruction. So we can certainly have that conversation about extending the voluntary transfer period. But again, I'm not sure it's necessary. It seems like there's just one situation. Um, and I think we can clarify that um, with having a discussion with the, uh, the regional superintendents about what their intent is. It doesn't make what you've told me doesn't really make a lot of sense in that the, the person who's giving up the teacher the regional and the principal are fine with giving up the teacher to move to this other position. It's the receiving re re regional that doesn't want them to come in. So I think there's probably more to that story than I'm getting. But, I, you know, when we get off, you know, I can get some more information from you guys and we can, uh, Darnese or I can look into that and figure that out. Denise, you had something else to add? Yeah, just for a point of clarification, that we're talking about the extension of this Two week period just specifically for these jobs. It's not opening everything wide. That's understood. No, I I understand. I want to make sure I put it out there. That's just okay. And again, the, the reason for that is because I can say that I, I've gotten at least a dozen people ask about the process. And when I explain to them that it requires the approval of their existing principal, 
like I said, that, you know, that's not a new thing. It's just new in this circumstance um, that people will not apply knowing that their principal can reject them. And, and then they would feel like, you know, they're being held back by their principal from something they wanted to do or that they're being viewed as someone who is trying to run away from the school. Cause I've heard that for years, um, you know, as a concern of teachers, but again, this is a, what we view as a unique circumstance. So it's not just a handful who have said that they've applied and been, been gate checked already. It's a number of people have said they're not going to apply because they don't want the possibility of being gate checked by their, their existing principal and having that relationship where it looks like they were trying to leave the team, quote unquote. Okay. And we can, I could talk to Keith and Glenda about it and get uh, feedback from Mr. Tierney and um, from the powers that be and find out uh, whether we can agree to that or not. Thank you. Is there anything else? Yeah. Uh, well, especially while Keith and Glenda are still here. Uh, uh, I heard one of the board members speak about permanent subs uh at a board meeting at one point and talking about bringing bringing them back um, We've, yeah i tried i tried reaching out to the board member prior to that meeting but i didn't get a return phone call we i've made it clear then that they can't they can't do that without talking to you guys first without bargaining that yeah. because the contract is very clear that we are not hiding we're not hiring those any longer we cease doing yeah. that back whenever that was that was agreed upon years and years ago um yeah. So we've we've already informed the board that it it also is like a forget the amount of money, but it's it's a huge financial hit, and it doesn't from what we've seen historically, it doesn't stop the need for substitutes because the principals just use those permanent subs to do other things around the school. Not necessarily if you have one per school, that's 180 we'd have to hire, and then so I think it's in the nine the nine million or even higher than that of proposition for hiring permanent subs. And then it doesn't solve the problem because then you've only got one sub at every school. Some schools need four or five per day. So we've been um, having discussions with the board about that. But if you want to have discussions with them, go right ahead. Um, no, let me, I, let me make my position clear on that. You know, I just heard them talking about it. And just like I mentioned about this issue, you know, if you, because I'm sure you started talking about the 369 positions prior to the date them being approved, and you know what I'm saying is, if discussions are taking place on that, if we could have a discussion about that with you before something comes down the pike and and is you know board approved, you know, so we could, if there were some parameters, you know, we could we could discuss that. I'm not promoting it or not. I was just now we, we have we have to negotiate that with you because the contract right. is very clear that we are not permitted to hire them. Right. So we right. we can't go and have something board approved because we have to get that as long as I'm here, I've made that position very clear. The contract says we are not to hire those positions. Um and so we cannot do that unless we negotiate a change with CTI. Right, you're right. And I understood that. I mean, I, that, that's understood because it says those positions will will terminate as they expire. So so we know the contract is clear on that part. I was just saying, since I heard the, the rumblings, I was just thinking that, you know, if we can kind of get ahead of any conversations with that before we, you know, get into a tight, tight position. And so yeah. you would know what our position Understood. That was just a, a one board member making that comment. We tried to get ahead of it and talk to them prior to the meeting. But like I said, I phone calls don't yeah. always get returned. <laughs> All right, De Denise. Yeah, the only thing that I wanted to, um, I had a concern about with this quote unquote PLC learning team facilitator um, is the actual use of this individual that it is going to be supporting education in regards to in the classroom and not end up as an administ quasi administrative position. Keith, do you want to speak to the role of that position? Yeah, and Dr. Sheffield jump in as well. But this position would facilitate meetings with either grade level or content level um, teachers to support PLCs that are happening now, right? So if they're looking at data, looking at curriculum, 
or looking at um, anything that we currently do in a PLC to help facilitate those conversations. Um, they could support um, any after after meeting follow up or before meeting follow up. Um, organize stuff for teachers and bring them resources so that they don't have to bring those to the table. Um, essentially, these positions should making life easier for the classroom teachers and to help facilitate um, these meetings so they're more there's less on a teacher's plate leaving those in an ideal situation when run well. Glenda, did you want to add? Or, no, I just... no, I think you said it, Keith. I mean, because at the end of the day, as these positions were created, and that's exactly why you didn't see anything called a coach, because we don't need quasi-administrators. And it was important for us, and I think you guys have heard me say more so the times and enough that my biggest focus is around teacher capacity and their pedagogy. And when these resources are gone, that we are building a foundation there for our teachers to where they can sustain the sustainability and the professional growth of our teachers and the impact that it's going to have for teachers. So when all of this is pulled away, that the foundation doesn't um, doesn't fall. So Denise, to your point, that's why you won't see anything that talks about any kind of coach because we do have sometimes where our coaches become quasi administrators, and that's not the intent of any of these positions. So, so I, maybe to be more specific or direct, I think to what Denise was getting at because we had talked before the meeting. Obviously, are are these PLC facilitators going to have autonomy? Or obviously they'll have you know guidelines or, or you know assignments basically, but are are they going to have autonomy to do their job, or is the administration of a school going to say um, here are A B C D E F G topics you must do this? Are they going to be directed by administrators? But they should. I mean, Justin. I mean, the gist of all of this is you know for our facilitators, which there are teachers too, is to be working alongside with their, their peers, those that have decided to participate, you know, in their professional learning um, meetings and so forth. Um, again, it's nothing that we are mandating because we are not going to go back down that road with PLCs. But we do have a lot of teachers that do want to collaborate, that do want to plan together mm -hmm. and utilizing the data and so forth. So that's that role of that PLC facilitator is to help build some break, bridge the gap and bring some of those pieces together. And to Keith's point, to leverage the teachers, to give the teachers some time, some additional time to do some of those things that they so desire to do. Like they may want to utilize that data to inform teaching and learning and to dig a little deeper, but they don't have the time to pull that data or to do that diagnosis. So those are the kind of conversations that they're having with that facilitator. The way that facilitator could do some of those big rocks and some of those pieces for them and to help them with that planning or their lesson planning and those kind of things. But it's their peers. It's not a leadership position. It's not someone that's evaluative or any of those things. All right. And, and again, we, one, we respect that and we understand that that's why we were just asking to get clarity for our sake to, to know if, if this person's going to be, you know, dedicating themselves to this new role as if they were a regular teacher, but now they have full time to do it versus. Yeah, it's full time and the principals understand because, and it was important for us in terms of even like say, the teachers that are on their campus serve, working with their colleagues because they're, they're still teachers working with their colleagues and there is a non-negotiable that we have to where we can assist that, that facilitator to where they can be effective with their job. It's where we have a PLC specialist here that would be out of teaching and learning that's indulge into you know our curriculum that's working with the teachers to where we all are speaking the same language and and they're providing support that's present for the moment and you know they'll come off campus once a month um you know for their um you know for their for their cadre um to just talk about how things are going and how we can further assist you know and aura and i can't think of the other young lady that worked with Rose Backus back then when they were language I'm learning team facilitators. Um, they transitioned over to that PL, those PLC pieces, right? Which some of it was the same work. And those are the two same individuals that are leading this group. So they were just excited because I'm telling you, I was one of those principals 
um, a AAA principal with the AAA plan and with the learning team facilitators. And when I tell you I know it worked, it worked. Um, so, you know, it's just at my big piece is around teacher capacity and providing the support for our teachers, because this is going to be some heavy lifting that our teachers and they're going to need help with it. That's why you will see also with some of those positions around the teacher resource. Well, the teacher resource, again, the teacher resource is not for them to be cafeteria duties or walk in the halls with the radio. Teacher resource is exactly what it is, where they can go in a classroom, they could model instruction for a teacher that may be having some difficulties. When you think around some of your new teachers, right? Um, model, model the instruction, not only model instruction and working alongside with the teachers, but they can also pull small group and work with small group. So again, we're not going back down the road with coaches where we say coaches can't work with kids and we got to keep up with the coaches law. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So it's all around the teacher capacity for me in working alongside with teachers and them being colleagues and nothing that's an evaluative. Thank you, Glenn. Well, it feels like we've we've covered a lot here, so we'll get back to you on on the the ask that you had. Um, so, unless there's anything further, we can stop recording the meeting and and be completed for today. Theo, you muted. Yeah. Did you uh, have any information about what's happening with Congress Middle? We're gonna we're gonna get back to you. Um, Darnie should be reaching out to you either today or tomorrow. Okay. We're we're pulling. We've pulled together a lot of data for you. Okay. Okay. And we do have we have one more quick item just to bring to your attention, but it's not relevant to this conversation. So um, it'd be up to you to if you want to turn off the recording. We just have a concern to raise. Okay. Let me just stop that.